relationship that I have with Maya Angelou comes from a place and a space that is beyond just um, the two of us. She's a woman who, who has jumped into so many different roles in different parts of her life. She's an author, she's a, a civil rights activist, a dancer, she's a singer. Dr. Maya Angelou is beyond the words pioneer. Maya Angelou's greatest accomplishment is really the fact that she has liberated herself enough to be able to tell the truth. It feels to me like she is a gift to me provided by uh, a divine source, God. There's nothing I don't love about my life. It's a struggle, but that's life. That's why they call it life. She was born Marguerite Annie Johnson in St. Louis in 1928. To Bailey Johnson, a Navy dietitian and Vivian Baxter, a real estate agent and nurse. Older brother Bailey Jr. gave her the nickname Maya. Maya was a toddler when the family moved west. My mother and father agreed to disagree and uh, divorced. And they sent me and my brother alone by train from Los Angeles, California, to Stamps, Arkansas. You know, you take two little children, and you put them on a train and send them down south. I guess they did that back then. But oftentimes, the children will feel abandoned. It was only the kindness of the Pullman car porters and the dining car waiters who took us off trains and put us on other trains that we really arrived in Stamps, Arkansas. With one-way tickets pinned to four-year-old Bailey's coat, Maya, then three, and her brother were met by their grandmother, Annie Henderson, who raised them for four years. My grandmother and my Uncle Willie owned a store. It was the only black-owned store in the town. Largely absent, their father reappeared briefly before Maya and Bailey were uprooted yet again and returned to their mother in Missouri. When we were taken, picked up and taken to St. Louis, to my mother's people, who were very, very educated, very erudite, very sophisticated, all of that. But here, Maya suffered a terrifying ordeal that would change her young life. I was molested. She had been raped by someone that my grandmother, Lady Baxter, knew. And uh, she only told my father who the man was. Later, maybe a couple of days later, they found the man and he had been kicked to death, probably by her uncles. My seven-year-old logic told me that my voice had killed him, so I stopped speaking. My mother's people and my mother did their best to try to woo me away from my mutism, but they didn't know what my voice could do. So. After the rape, Maya and Bailey were sent back to Stamps, Arkansas to live with Grandmother Henderson. My mother and her people sent me and Bailey back to, to Stamps. Mm. It was heaven on earth because my grandmother, my father's mother, was all of that. She thought I was the bee's knee. Oh, here you have this adoring grandmother, over six feet tall, immaculate in her big starch white aprons. Marguerite was able to just be a little girl there and be free and be loved. I felt I could speak to Bailey because I loved him so much that nothing I could do would hurt him. During the time when Aunt Maya uh, was mute after the rape, she only talked to Bailey. He encouraged her. He told her he, that she was brilliant, that she was beautiful. He lifted her up. What I appreciate the most about the story about her being mute is that her grandmother said, baby, you'll talk when you're ready. People wanted to look at her and say that something was wrong. She's like, when she's ready, she'll talk. For over five years, Maya was mute. But the attention of a concerned teacher helped the traumatized girl regain her voice. My grandmother gave me a tablet. So I just, I wrote everything. 
And uh, there was a black lady in my town, Mrs. Flowers, who came to the store. She told my grandmother she'd like to take me to the school, to the black school. She said, I want you to read every book in this, in this room. I tell you, it seemed like thousands of books to me. I found poetry. Oh, and I loved it. So I memorized things. I memorized, I mean, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, James Weldon Johnson. I had Edgar Allan Poe. I liked Poe so much, I called him Eep. And I memorized that 30 more than that sonnets of Shakespeare. And Miss Flowers, she would read poetry to him. And Marguerite would tell her, oh, that she loved poetry. Oh, she'd write it on her note. I love poetry. She said, you do not like poetry. I wrote, yes, ma'am. She wouldn't even look at my tablet. And the teacher would tell her, no, you don't, you don't love poetry. You can only love poetry if you can say it and hear it. Until you feel it come across your tongue, over your lips, out into air, you've pushed it out. I tell you, I wept. I thought she was taking my best friend away. I think it was Mrs. Flowers who always had said to her, one day I know you're gonna speak, and it was because of poetry that she finally was able to um, regain her voice. In poetry, Maya discovered the beauty and power of words. But real life more often showed her pain and ugliness. Bailey had seen a man, not lynched, but he had seen him after he was lynched. I was 13, he was 15. In the South at that time, a black boy in particular, probably a black man too, but a black boy had to get off the street and walk down in the gutter if a white man, a white person was passing. And Bailey refused. And my grandmother heard about it, and she said, they'll lynch him. I can't save him. As she tells the story of Bailey and the story of the family making a choice to protect the son, to protect the black man by removing him from the South, it is in part a story about how African peoples in America, black people in this country are here, we're of the land, we've worked the land, we've bled and sweat into the land, and yet somehow, in order to be fully human, have to leave the very land that we've cultivated. Next, Maya breaks down a racial barrier in San Francisco. There were no black uh, streetcar conductors, no black female streetcar conductors, and Maya set out to become the first. Now a teen, and nearly to her six-foot height, Maya and her family returned to California, where her boldness got her hired as San Francisco's first black streetcar conductor. I took a job once as a streetcar conductor in San Francisco. I was 16. There were, weren't that many jobs that African-American women could get young at that time, but there were a few. There were no black uh, streetcar conductors, no black female streetcar conductors, and Maya set out to become the first. I could see her as a young woman daring <laughs> to apply for a job as a streetcar conductor, daring to do it. So I had seen women on the streetcars, and I liked it. They, they had uniforms and a little money changer, you know, and they had a cap with a bib on it. And I thought, I'd look kind of cute in that. So I said I wanted a, a job on the streetcars, so my mother said, well, go and apply. I went down to the place they wouldn't even accept, give me an application. Finally, after about three weeks, a man came out of the office. He asked me what was my what, um, experience that I had. I lied like a drunkard fool. I said I had been the chaufferette of Mrs. Annie Henderson in Stamps, Arkansas. 
she was six feet tall. Very, very well built. Beautiful chocolate skin. And she walked with such grace and pride. Can you imagine somebody by his height running the streetcar? Huh? Can you? I couldn't believe it myself. <laughs> but I knew it was so. When I first heard that, I would see the cable cars going by and I would just be like, there's, you know, there's no way that this could, this could happen. But I guess it really is a test to, you never know who is really driving your bus, driving your cab, or driving anything. At 16, Maya became pregnant after a brief romance with another teen. She was a mother so young, you know, and I know that she was mothered so well, so she knew how to take care of her son, and she took Guy with her everywhere. After graduating from high school, Maya went from struggling teen mom to fulfilled artist. After supporting herself and baby Guy, mainly as a cook and a waitress. In the early 50s, Maya married Greek sailor Tosh Angelos. Though the marriage was short, Maya began pursuing her dream to dance. After her divorce, she took the name Angelou. I studied dance, you see, from the time I was 14. I got a scholarship to study at the California Labor School. I studied modern ballet. And I got a scholarship to study with Miss Pearl Primus in New York. And I went to New York and studied carrying my son all the while. When she talks about that period in her life when she was dancing, she just glows. You know, she lights up because you know that that was the engine, if you will, that really propelled her forward into everything else that she's done. Dance and writing were the only things I ever really loved to do. You know that, you know, her first dance partner was Alvin Alley. And when we think about that, then we know that if you're dancing with Alvin Alley, you have to be a great dancer. Not satisfied only to dance, Maya found another outlet for her creativity and excelled. I started singing for a living in, the, uh, in San Francisco with uh, Phyllis Diller. Mort Saul and the King Trio. In 1954, she joined a European tour of Porgy and Bess, George Gershwin's soulful opera about black life in South Carolina. She was just always following who she was, and that's her, she's always, you know, striving to open up to become more of who she is. After the tour, she returned to clubs, then landed a recording deal earning notoriety with a Louis Jordan and Ella Fitzgerald novelty song. I was singing in Las Vegas. I was asked by Liberty Records to do an album. I purchased it. It was an LP. Very difficult to forget because she was wearing a long red dress. She was barefooted. She had a huge afro, and she was singing with a West Indian accent, Stone Cold Dead in the Market. Stone Cold Dead in the Market, Stone Cold Dead in the Market, and I kill nobody but my husband. I love Maya the Calypso singer. Well, A, I'm a sucker for Calypso music, and I love it that she was the Calypso queen of the West Coast. The Calypso period was interesting. I was about 10. We were living in Los Angeles for the for a significant element of that. At that time, it was considered exotic. Her passion started, you know, the dancing and the singing. And to see her today, I mean, I, I, what I want to know is, did she see that then? Did she see where she could go? Or where she was absolutely going? Or where she was just an artist trying to feed her child and, and, and get some type of level of respect and maybe a modicum of, of success? Next, how Maya made her mark back east in New York. I said to myself, this is a woman to be reckoned with and I'm staying away from her. <laughs> Looking to commit herself to serious writing, in 1959, Angelou moved back to New York and hooked up with writer friends in Harlem, 
where a new and vibrant literary scene was flourishing. Harlem has never been an exclusively black space, but it has been a uniquely black space, one that has had um, kind of a, a, an incubator for black cultural and artistic capacity. The authors who founded the Guild, which was uh, Rosa Guy, Dr. John Henry Clark, John Oliver Killens, and Walter Christmas, they needed a hiding place where they could meet and hone their craft and learn from each other. She says that they would meet in, in someone's apartment and just be up all night writing, exchanging ideas. When Maya Angelou uh, engages in New York in the Harlem Writers Guild, particularly with men like Killens, who are very interested in writing things that are often grotesque and difficult. John, Maya says, you know, really encouraged her to pursue her writing. Come to New York and join the Writers Guild. Come to New York, you'll find a community of black writers who will be there to support you. It was like coming home, is the way she's described the experience. It helped her to hone her, you know, get her writing skills tight. In this crowd, Maya blossomed. She wrote, she sang at the Apollo Theater, and acted on stage in Jean Genet's The Blacks. The first day of rehearsal, she walked in with her very close friend, uh, Abby Lincoln, and she towered over everyone and exuded a power that I had not recognized in anyone other than my mother. It was in her height, it was in her carriage, it was in her voice. And I said to myself, this is a woman to be reckoned with, and I'm staying away from her. <laughs> she also became more politically engaged and worked for Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in New York. When I was 14, my mother took the position of head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference for Dr. Martin Luther King in New York. Maya Angelou is not a marginal person. She does not hang out on the sides or the corners of the room or in the shadows, right? She's, she's at the center of it. And it's true whether we're talking about, uh, you know, her experiences in the civil rights movement or the anti-colonial movement. My mother's friends were people like James Baldwin, Oscar Brown Jr. before he became famous. Who knew what famous was? Godfrey Cambridge was driving a cab when I met him. The only people who had any money were um, Sidney Poitier and Harry Belafonte. And the only reason I knew they had money was when Dr. King came to town and needed money. Those were the guys he went to. She's capturing and embodying a moment, not unlike our own moment. Um, the election of President Obama brought a variety of entertainers, show folk, people who were just on the edge of politics, fully into the political realm. I think the civil rights movement had some of that same sense of, wait a minute, we're making history, and I want to be part of making history. I want to have that story to tell. But Angelou's stint at SCLC was cut short when she fell in love with South African activist Bazumzi Maki. They married, and in 1960, along with Guy, moved to Cairo. In Egypt, Angelou worked as an editor for an English language weekly. When the brief marriage ended, in 1961, Maya and Guy relocated to the West African nation of Ghana, where she worked as an editor and journalist and traveled in a lively circle of expats. We can read work from many African Americans who, during the 50s and 60s, became engaged in the anti-colonial movement. There's a, a sense of the broader reality of blackness that is seductive um, politically and culturally. When Maya Angelou was in Ghana, it was a time when Malcolm came to Ghana. They uh, would have dinners for him and stay up way into the night talking to him about his beliefs and what, he, what difference he was gonna make. Next, Maya comes home to work with Malcolm X, but her hope for her country is met by tragedy. My sister friend called. She asked me, she said, Sister, have you, have you listened to the telephone or radio? I said, no. She said, don't answer the phone, I'm on my way.
After more than four years in Africa, Angelou returned to the U.S. to find a very different country than she had left. The battle for civil rights had grown heated and soon turned bloody. I once heard her say, how could I not? Freedom is what all human beings require. As an African American, it was something that, you know, we had been struggling for for 250 years. My mother went home to work for Malcolm X. It was her plan when she, you know, was coming back, came back from Africa, where she'd been living to work with Malcolm because she was so moved by this great work that he was about to embark upon. What's really beautiful about both of their lives is that they were very young activists. You know, they, they lived purpose-driven lives. I came back to the States to work with Malcolm from Ghana. The second day he died, he was killed. It pains me when I, when I think of the relationship that she had with Malcolm. She came back from Africa to meet with him. I didn't have that chance to do distraught over Malcolm's murder. Angelou sought solace by returning to her singing, this time in Hawaii. My brother came to the house. I was staying with my mother. I'd just come back from Africa. And uh, I, I was just constantly in tears, almost hysteria. And he said, come on, I want to buy you a drink. He took me up and down the Fillmore District in San Francisco. He said, well, I want you to go to Hawaii. We had an aunt there and start to sing. You sing. So I went to Hawaii and got a job as a singer. But as Billie Holiday told Angelou, you're going to be famous, but not for singing. I was doing very well when my customers started fading away. I wonder what on earth was that? Where are they going? I never thought my mother was a good singer because she was, we, we knew so many people like Nina Simone, Ella Fitzgerald, Abby Lincoln. And when she was in Porgy and Bess, she was with people who could, who had two octaves in their voice and could hold it for 60 seconds. You know what I mean? She was a great entertainer though. Great. And so some guy at the, at the bar said, they got a real singer down the street, <laughs> not you. So I went down, and the real singer stepped out on that stage, and she took it. The real singer was Della Reese. Della Reese could sing. No, I think she was pretty. I went back to Los Angeles and decided to write. Re-energized from her time in Hawaii, Angelou returned to the mainland and vowed to help realize the visions of Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. She got involved in the movement because, listen, they were there at a time when everybody who had anything to offer to our people and could be of use. She understood that uh, she had a role to play and a responsibility to be involved in the civil rights movement. Her support of King, uh, her marching. I think what Maya Angelou gave to the civil rights movement and that healing that took place during that period in this country is really not as well known as it should be. Oh, I have people who will tell you stories about her bravery, you know, about her breaking through barricades to save people from police bullies, you know, stories of her standing up to brute force to protect children, and really doing whatever it took to break through those barricades, those, those thick walls of racism. In 1968, Dr. King asked Maya to help with a march for the poor. She agreed, but with a caveat. Jimmy Baldwin was going to speak at uh, Carnegie Hall with Dr. Martin Luther King. So Jimmy asked me, and the family had a box. So we went, and everybody was great, of course. And Martin King, whoo, lordy. Then he spoke, that was it. I had worked for him years before. And Dr. King said, Maya, I tell you, I would like you to come back with me for one month, just one month. 
uh, I'm going to lead this march, this uh, poor people's march. So I need money. I'd like you to go around the country, go to every major city, go to every black church and ask each preacher to give me just the, the collection of one day a year. And uh, he said, preachers, black preachers love pretty women. And Jimmy Baldwin said, she'll go, she'll do it. And uh, so I said, yes, okay. I said, the only thing is, I will do it after my birthday. I have to explain to everybody why I'm coming back to with you after the one bit, from one month. My birthday is April the 4th. On April the 4th, I was cooking up the food for my party when my sister friend called. She asked me, she said, Sister, have you, have you listened to the telephone or radio or something? I said, no. She said, don't answer the phone, I'm on my way. She came, she came in the apartment. She said, Sister, Martin Luther King is dead. I tell you, I tell you, it just, all together, took, took all, all my stuff, all my stuff. I, I had no more there, there. Once again, there she is on the cusp of, you know, packing her bags and, you know, getting ready to hit the road to work for Martin and he too was assassinated. Because Martin was killed on Aunt Maya's birthday, for many years she didn't even celebrate her birthday. She often sighs deeply. Um, such pain, such loss. And she always talks about, you know, we will never know, you know, the, the potential of what might have happened. These people's death shattered our hopes. And hers as well. With now both Malcolm and Martin dead, Angelou and their widows formed a powerful and lasting friendship. Over the years, she and uh, Coretta King developed a very close sisterhood. Miss Coretta was her sister friend, and I was her brother friend. And the fact that, that a life could be taken on her birthday, you know, it, it, it's just, it, it does hurt her. My Angelou and Coretta King and Betty Shabazz were all very good friends. That was one powerful sisterhood, Betty Shabazz, Coretta Scott King, and Maya Angelou. Listen, I've actually been in the room with all of those women at the same time and felt like I was seven years old. I think I was 40 something at the time, but I felt like I was seven. And um, that's, that's really quite an extraordinary experience to be surrounded by that much feminine, you know, African-American female power. Whoo, it's a lot. It was also after Dr. King's death that Angelou revisited the most harrowing days of her childhood. After a book editor, introduced by James Baldwin, dared her to write her autobiography. In 1969, she met the challenge, delving into her past, and in doing so, rewriting black women's place in American literature. I called her and wrote her to try to get her to write something. She was very reluctant to do that. He called me about three times. I finally sort of shamed her. I said, you know, Maya, I think writing autobiography is the hardest thing in the world. Because autobiography, as literature, is almost never achieved. I know he had spoken to James Baldwin because Jimmy told him, if you really want it done, tell her she can't do it. And she said, wait a minute. She said, I'll do it. And she started writing, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings. I was so li literally fascinated by that story because I thought, first of all, I'd never read a book about a woman who was a black woman whose story was so similar to my own. You know, one of the first, uh, on the first page of the book, it starts with, what you're looking at me for didn't come to say, only came to say, happy Easter day. 
Um, and I grew up in the church doing Easter pieces. I am familiar with those lines. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings uh, is a book that uh, is raw and, and tells it like it is. I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings was not only liberating for Maya Angelou, as I'm sure it was, but it liberated black women too. Because up until that book was written, few, if any, black women had ever written about sexual violation. It gave us voice and wisdom and truth and opened the way for us to really look at our own lives and reflect on our own pain and our own growth and history. Everybody could identify with her life and the mistakes you make and how you must have the courage to bounce back. And I think uh, that's what that book did for a lot of people. It was, it was a, a foundation for courage. The book went on to sell more than four million copies was translated into 18 languages, sold in 19 countries, and in 1979 was adapted to a made-for-television movie. Over the next three decades, Angelou wrote more than 30 best-selling books, earned three Grammy Awards, earned a Tony nomination, directed a feature film, and earned numerous honorary degrees. Next, Angelou is presented with the opportunity of a lifetime at the inauguration of President Bill Clinton. I remember going to Chanel and buying that coat for her because she was like, well, I don't even know what I'm gonna wear. And I go, let me, I'll figure it out. Of all the titles she has earned, Poet is how most of us think of Dr. Angelou. The reach of my arms, the span of my hips, the stride of my step, the curl of my lips, because I'm a woman, phenomenally, phenomenal woman. So now you understand why my head's not bowed, why I don't even shout or even have to talk real loud. But when you see me coming, it ought to make you proud. I say it's the bend of my hair, the palm of my hand, the need for my care, because I'm a woman, phenomenally phenomenal woman that's me i probably have done that poem i would say more than my angelo maya the poet has you know just blossomed and grown and created these poems that speak to our to our experience and when i say our experiences to the african-american experience but to our experience, the female experience, to our experience, the human experience. It is her voice to which America so often turns to give our public milestones personal resonance. In 1993, the world watched as she read an original composition at the inauguration of President Bill Clinton, making her the first poet since Robert Frost to take part in that ceremony. When President Clinton asked her to do the poem, I was here. I was here visiting her, and we, she was living in this house. And she got very still, very still, and very quiet. So I think she went to that place inside of herself that she tells me about, that there is a place inside of us that no one can touch. I'll never forget that morning during the Clinton inauguration when Maya Angelou stepped to the microphone, to the podium, and recited on the Pulse of Morning, one of the most exquisite pieces of prose ever. I remember going to Chanel and buying that coat for her because she was like, well, I don't even know what I'm gonna wear. And I go, let me, I'll figure it out. And I bought that coat because I just wanted her to have some piece of me, some part of me to be you know, with her. Here, on the Pulse of this fine day, you may have the courage to look up and out and upon me, the rock, the river, the tree, your country, no less to Midas than the mendicant, no less to you now than the mastodon then. Here, on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face, your country, and say simply, very simply, with hope, good morning. It said something about Bill Clinton uh, to me, and I think to a lot of people, that he would invite Maya Angelou uh, to take such an important 
uh, play such an important role as his inauguration. Uh, and so many of us were very, very pleased about that. That platform, that exposure was larger than she ever had. Although the world knows her majestic voice, her elegant and imposing stature, family and friends know Dr. Maya Angelou as a loving and giving supporter, the ultimate friend and confidant. We started out as woman to woman and then grew into this spiritual bond of uh, friendship, sisterhood, uh, her being a mother, counselor, uh, mentor for me. I know that she understands a mother's love, the love of a mother and giving a love to a mother. I know she understands that very deeply. And she called me one day and she just said, ah, he hello, darling girl. I can't do her voice justice. Hello, darling girl. I was just calling to see how is your heart. What a wonderful way to say, how you doing? No, she was just grandma. I, I don't even think I really recognized who she was as a world figure or artist or anything until maybe I was 13, 14 years old. Oftentimes if I'm having trouble with, 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 with a family member or, or, or one of my daughters is giving me a hard time, I'll call her and she says, well, if you need me, I'll just I'll fly to you. I'll be there. With her 2004 cookbook, Dr. Angelou showed off her excellent cooking skills and love for entertaining. Dr. Angelo is known for her almost like, like fireside chats, you know, where you sit around over some food. Some, everything happens around food with her. An invitation to Maya Angelou's home in North Carolina is the golden ticket. You're going to have fascinating people sitting at the table. Is there a better evening? I don't think so. I don't think so. In 1998, the first Maya Angelou Charter School opened in Washington, D.C., reaching out to troubled students. Recalling how education turned her life around, Angelou stays closely involved with the program. She's available for not only well-known people like Oprah Winfrey, who loves her beyond, she's available to the community, to people who we don't know, to people who aren't in the lights, whose names aren't in lights, who aren't, you know, famous, but who have a worthy cause. At 81, Dr. Angelou shows no signs of slowing. She recently penned a book, Letter to My Daughter, compiling wisdom for the girl child she never had. I was one of the people she dedicated it to and I didn't even know I was in it. It might not be what you need right this moment, but there's gonna be a period in your life. There's gonna be something that's gonna happen where you're gonna reach for that book and the answer that you need is gonna be right there. Still growing and curious, Dr. Angelou is currently enrolled in divinity school. It's just so that I can be more, better, more giving, more wise. I think that's a great lesson for us all. For people who think I am all that, I am really good, I'm all set, I'm straight. You know, that here she is still trying to be better, do better herself. Conquering abuse as a little girl in St. Louis and mutinous as a young girl in Stamps, Arkansas, Maya Angelou became a dancer, singer, actor, activist, poet, author, teacher, student, friend, mother, grandmother, a survivor. With her life and words, she has inspired generations. Maya Angelou has given us and what her legacy, you know, will be is that it's possible. Whatever it is, it is possible. And because of Maya Angelou, um, we were able, and we as black women have been able to be accepting of ourselves. I think she had a lot to do with that. Her legacy will be to live fully, even though you make mistakes, that it's good you learn from your mistakes and you keep moving. And I think that you never, never, ever give up. You will still see her at a book signing, hold hands and hug for, out, for over an hour when she should, you know, she should be home. But the fact that she is willing to put aside how she feels and what she's going through for others, is just, it's, it's my, that is Dr. Maya Angelou. The real legacy is how she moved people to a higher knowing of themselves. You just don't know all the lives that she has touched. And so the legacy is every life that was moved by her words, every life that was moved uh, by her being here. So you, you, you can't write what that legacy is. 
we don't know what that legacy is. What do I love about my life? There's nothing I don't love about my life. It's a struggle, but that's life. That's why they call it life. When I see cruelty, that's, that's unfair, un, un, that's un, it's nasty. Cruelty to anyone, just rude and stupid. Um, but I don't see a lot of that, and if I do, I try to do something about it, rather than I don't just sit in the dark and curse the dark. I try to light a match. Mr. President and Mrs. Clinton, Mr. Vice President and Mrs. Gore, and Americans everywhere, a rock, a river, a tree, hosts to species long since departed, marked the mastodon, the dinosaur, who left dry tokens of their sojourn here on our planet floor. Any broad alarm of their hastening doom is lost in the gloom of dust and ages. But today, the rock cries out to us, clearly, forcefully, come, you may stand upon my back and face your distant destiny but seek no haven in my shadow. I will give you no hiding place down here. You, created only a little lower than the angels, 